So up to now we've been talking about electric field. The big concept this semester is field. And we've been talking about electric fields. Um, and we've talked about two examples of fields. Electric fields are made by charged particles. And what do they do? They affect other charged particles. We talked briefly about gravitational fields at the beginning of the semester. Gravitational fields are made by massive objects and they affect anything else that has a mass. <coughs> um, and these fields move throughout space, you know, fill all um, changes in the field, either gravitational or electric, can only, that information can only travel at the speed of light. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so both of those fields are, are vector fields. <coughs> We're coming now to another kind of field. It's different from either of those fields. Uh, and it's magnetic field. And like, like electric field and gravitational field, uh, magnetic field is associated with a source. It has a magnitude and a direction. And it affects other things. But the difference in magnetic field and electric field, there are a lot of differences. Uh, but, but a key difference is that although any charged particle produces an electric field, so if you think of this as a proton, it is also making an electric field, which we are not showing here, because it, it's just messy if I do. But it has to be moving to make a magnetic field. So moving charged particles make magnetic fields. <coughs> And uh, we'll see, what do they do? What do magnetic fields do? Well, what we're going to talk about at first is that what magnetic fields do is affect compasses. So we're going we're to talk about using compasses to measure and detect magnetic fields. Eventually, a little bit down the road, we'll see that magnetic fields can also exert forces on moving charged particles. But for right now, we're just going to focus on what magnetic fields are, how they're made, and how we detect them with a compass, which is a piece of equipment that exists in the lab upstairs so that you can measure magnetic fields. And guess what you're going to be doing this week? Measuring magnetic fields due to moving charges. Um, <coughs> it's tough to moving charge in lab. Um, it's really easy to work with a lot of charges moving through a wire, an electric current, so we're going to be working with current carrying wires um, and looking at their magnetic fields. <coughs> and one of the things we'll talk about either today or next time is, is being very quantitative about the magnetic field made by a current in a wire. But for right now, we're going to worry about <coughs> magnetic fields. Now, this is, this is a moving proton. And you can see that the pattern of field it makes uh, is kind of an interesting one because this is the first kind of a field we've seen. So, so in this representation, as usual, the tail of an arrow is at an observation location and the direction of the arrow is the direction of the field and the length of the arrow is about the magnitude of the field. <coughs> but notice that these fields do not point directly away from the moving charge. <coughs> so if you imagine a vector r going to some observation location, this field is just not pointing away from that charge. In fact, there's this interesting sort of curly pattern. It's, it, it, it forms concentric rings around the moving charge. And, and it, it clearly is proportional to distance because as the charge, <coughs> so if we consider an observation location kind of in the middle here, not much is happening until it gets close and then the field gets really big and then as the particle goes farther away the field gets smaller so clearly it depends on distance the way we've seen fields you know in the past do um, but the direction of the field is pretty interesting uh, and so that's one of the things we're going to try to make quantitative today okay So, um, 
So how do we detect magnetic fields? Oh, I didn't want to blank that. I want to show you one more picture. Um, so how do we detect magnetic fields with compasses? Well, in lab you have made currents run through wires by connecting wires to batteries and you know there's a current running through the wire because you see a light bulb light, right? So if you take, if you have a compass, you know that a compass needle just points, aligns with the Earth's magnetic field, right? That's what a, what a compass does is the needle is supposed to align with the net magnetic field at the location of the needle. So if we have um, a, suppose we're looking down at a table on which a compass is resting, okay? And if we have, if we see that the, the compass needle is pointing that way, we'll say, well, it's, it's aligning with the net magnetic field at that, its location, and that field must be pointing that way. And we call that north. Okay, so it's pointing north. The compass is labeled in here. Um, <coughs> and if we did something to the compass, like we brought a magnet, unsurprisingly, magnets make magnetic fields too. So we put a magnet here. <coughs> This might deflect because now the magnetic field at its location is a sum of two fields, the Earth's field and the field of this magnet. And so it, so what a compass does is a compass just points in the direction of the net field at its location. <coughs> now one of the things you'll see in lab, and lab is super important this week just to see these phenomena because I don't have a way to, to show them to you here with little teeny equipment and no overhead projector or whatever. Um, <coughs> one of the things you'll see in lab is if you uh, make a circuit so that there's a light and then you take one of these wires that has a current flowing through it and you very carefully lower it down so it's exactly aligned <coughs> north-south with this compass that's pointing north-south. <coughs> so here's our wire. We're going to lay it. Here's our wire. Here's our wire. We have a current flowing through it. We bring it close to the compass, very carefully aligning it north-south. The compass is going to deflect one way or the other. Okay, so that's, and you'll, you can measure, read the compass deflections. On the other hand, what you should see is that if you bring in your current carrying wire this way, aligned east-west, you won't see any deflections. And from that we can deduce something about the nature of the magnetic field made by the moving electrons in the wire. <coughs> so we can be quantitative about this. Um, and this you'll need to know for lab. Uh, so if we have the magnetic field a uh, magnetic field has a symbol B. It's a vector. Um, its units are Tesla, capital T, not named for the car, uh, named for the inventor. <laughs> um, So if the and so we'll we'll say this is the Earth's magnetic field, then our compass needle <coughs> points that way. <coughs> if on the other hand <coughs> we have the magnetic field of the Earth, and then we bring in something else that makes a magnetic field, a current carrying wire, a magnet something else, and let's say it makes a magnetic field <coughs> due to something else, then at this, at this location, the net field is, of course, the vector sum of those two fields. 
So we would have <coughs> so we'd have a net field like this. And so if we put a compass here, it should align like this. So we should see the compass needle So the compass deflects by some angle theta. <coughs> which is which is that angle. So if we knew the magnetic field of the Earth, um, and the magnetic field of the Earth at this location uh, is actually not completely horizontal. Okay, so the Earth's magnetic field <coughs> looks something like this uh, surrounding the Earth. At, so it, at the equator it's parallel, but as when we're up here by the poles it's actually like this, and here it's something like that. Since we're not at the equator, uh, the, the Earth's magnetic field is not entirely horizontal here, but what a compass measures is the horizontal component of the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, so a compass needle doesn't do this, but it, it, it does this, measuring the horizontal component. So the horizontal component um, of the Earth's magnetic field here is about two times take a, 10 to the negative fifth Tesla. <coughs> and let's say this, this other thing here, whatever it is, <coughs> is about three times 10 to the negative six Tesla. <coughs> So what compass deflection should we expect? What is, what is theta? <coughs> compass deflection. Trig. Trig, trig you're right. <laughs> okay, so <coughs> we see from this triangle that uh, the ratio of this, we're calling it the magnetic field due to this other thing to the magnetic field of the Earth should be the tangent of theta, right? So we've got, so we've got the magnitude of the magnetic field of whatever the other thing was so uh, Yeah, right. So theta is the arctangent of here. Theta is the arctangent of and so that's three times ten to the negative six tesla over two times ten to the negative five tesla, and it comes out to about eight and a half degrees. Now you're going to be able to read these compasses to, they're, they're, they're labeled in, I think, two degree increments. You should be able to read them to one degree, more or less. Um, you do need to be a little careful. Um, okay, suppose instead you saw a 15 degree deflection how would we figure out what the magnetic field due to this other source was? <coughs> so we have <coughs> is <coughs> the Earth <coughs> tangent of 15 degrees, right? <coughs> and so if we work out 
uh, it's about <coughs> something like 5.4 times 10 to the negative 6 Tesla. <coughs> okay, so there's not that much to it. But the key thing to keep in mind is this vector addition of magnetic fields and the fact that the compass is going to point in the direction of the net field at its location. <coughs> And another key thing to keep in mind is that you, if you want the angle in degrees, you better put your calculator in degrees. And if you're using vPython, it expects radians. So you need to convert to radians and convert back to degrees. And also the function of A tan. Uh, yeah, it's, it's in, in vPython, it's A tan theta, um, which you can find out by Googling trig functions in Python. Um, so, okay. Now, the fact that we'd get a deflection like this <coughs> by putting <coughs> a current carrying wire on top of our compass, which is already aligned with the Earth's magnetic field, suggests that the magnetic field made by the current in the wire, underneath the wire, because that's where the compass is. So we're looking down on the table, so the compass is under our wooden wire here. Um, magnetic field is actually perpendicular to the wire. This looks like this. So, okay, so, um, so the magnetic field made by charged particles, which are uh, certainly is in a direction perpendicular to the motion of the particles. <coughs> and in fact, uh, Mathematically, does that suggest a vector operation to you? Which one? Cross product. Yep, <coughs> that's right. So, yeah. So, the magnetic field of a moving charged particle. at some location, of course, because it has to be at some location, <coughs> is <coughs> given by a law named after two French physicists, B.O. and Savard, unless it was one French physicist who had a hyphenated last name, B.O. Savard. It's two, okay. Um, the B.O. Savard law. <coughs> and uh, except for the cross product, it's actually kind of familiar. So there's a constant. Uh, the constant's a little different. It's called mu zero over four pi. Um, and it has a very convenient value. Uh, mu zero over four pi is exactly one times 10 to the negative seven uh, Tesla meter per Coulomb per second. <coughs> and it's proportional to the charge of the particle. Okay, not a big surprise. Alpha particle is going to make a magnetic field twice as big as proton. So we have a Q. <coughs> and it falls off with distance. We saw that from that animation, and in fact, it falls off with distance like 1 over distance squared, so 1 over r squared. <coughs> so that part looks pretty familiar. We've got a constant, we've got a 1 over r squared, we've got a q in the numerator. The only uh, difference is this piece <coughs> Uh, 
and there's a V, which is the velocity of the moving charged particle, cross R hat. Now, uh, what R is the same thing it always is, so if we've got a charged particle <coughs> with some velocity V, and we've got some observation location here, then <coughs> R is the vector from the source to the observation location, so that's, that's also exactly the same. Um, <coughs> So this is called the BIOS of our law. And let's see, uh, let's see what it predicts for us. So let's just refresh our memory of cross products because it's been a minute since we did anything with cross products. Um, let's see. Examples. Since I can't find it, I'll find it this way. Here we go. Okay, so you've seen this before. Um, uh, is a way of combining two vectors, which are uh, two vectors define a plane, unless they're collinear, in which case they don't define a plane. But um, <coughs> So this is the cross product of red cross green is perpendicular to the plane containing the red vector and the green vector. So if the red vector was V in our case and the green vector was R hat, you know, then um, then, uh, then the cross product is perpendicular to them. It has a maximum when the two vectors are at right angles to each other. It goes to zero if they are either in the same direction or exactly opposite to each other. And it can be in one direction or other just depending on the angle between them. Okay. <coughs> and um, here, let's. Um, and as you as you probably remember, I hope from talking about angular momentum, uh, the direction of a cross product you can find without doing any math at all just by using your right hand. Remember that the order of a cross product matters, so A cross B is not equal to B cross A. Um, so we point our right hand with a uh, rigid wrist in the direction of the first vector, which is the red vector in this case because we're talking about red cross green. And then we want to curl our fingers through the angle between the vectors to the green vector, but I can't do it here because I would break my wrist if I did that, so I have to turn my hand over and curl my fingers from the red vector to the green vector, and then my thumb sticks out in the direction of the result, which is the yellow vector, okay? So, um, cross products require that you're not inhibited about actually getting your right hand out of your pocket and actually doing something with it. And it's really important to be able to do that because sometimes we just want to know a direction and sometimes you really need to check your results. <coughs> um, recall also that there are two mathematical ways to evaluate <coughs> a cross product. <coughs> so, 
So if C is A cross B, then the magnitude of C is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle between them, where this is the, the smaller of the two possible angles you could take. Okay? And then you get the direction <coughs> by the right hand rule. <coughs> or <coughs> there's this other uh, <coughs> whole vector formalism you can do. So the x component of the result is going to be, what is it? It's x, y, z, x, y, z. So the x component is b, y, no, a, y, b, z <coughs> minus a, z, b, y. The y component, that's going to give us c and x, so it would be az bx minus ax bz. And the z component involves x and y, so that's ax by minus <coughs> ay bx. <coughs> And this is the form you're going to need to use if you have the vectors, but don't know the angle between them, unless you want to go to all the trouble of finding the angle between them. Yes? That's just by determinants, right? You can use determinants. <coughs> um, now, I mean, unless you have something that's in some direction with <coughs> arbitrary observation locations, we're often going to give problems where we're, say, in the xy plane, in which case, you'll be able to figure out which component is non-zero and only worry about that, which makes this thing much simpler. In vPython, um, it would be C equals cross AB, and as long as you remember that A is vector, if you, as long as you remember that, and B is vector something, uh, vPython will do it for you, which is also extremely nice. And it's doing, it's doing that. It's doing that full calculation, of course. <coughs> so, um, things to watch out for here. You need to memorize this. Um, this is R hat, not R. Okay? So this is a V cross R hat. If you do V cross R, you'll get the wrong answer. So, <coughs> uh, but you should be able to do these things. Um, let's see. So, so what's the direction of this cross product? <coughs> yeah, that's right. You're going to need your right hand and you're going to have to figure out a way to to hold it so that you can <coughs> you can actually <coughs> Okay, so what's the answer? No. Okay, we do not agree. <laughs> okay, so one way, so one way to, to, to simplify the decision is to say, well, one vector is along the z-axis and another vector is along the y-axis. So therefore, my answer has to be perpendicular to the yz plane. So it's either going to be plus or minus x. Right, so if you're getting something that's not perpendicular to the yz plane, um, 
then you you need to think again. Now, how would I do it? I would point my hand into the board and minus Z and then discover that I can't curl my fingers up so I'd rotate my hand and I'd curl my fingers up towards plus Y and my thumb would stick out in the plus X direction so I would say it was plus X. <coughs> so questions about that? Okay, you gotta be able to do this. Uh, okay, here's, so this is just the, whoops, this is the inverse, so this is zero four zero cross zero zero negative three. So actually figure it out using your hand, okay? <coughs> Okay, so what'd you get? <coughs> yes, it's negative x. We have, we want to point our fingers up because the first vector is in the plus y direction. And conveniently, it's actually easy to curl my fingers in toward the negative z direction and my thumb sticks out in the negative x direction. And um, <coughs> if you're right-handed, you have to remember to put your pencil down before you do this. Now, if you're left-handed, you're really lucky because you can... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can't remember this So you curl the first vector to the second vector? Yeah, yeah. So you point your... I mean, so the first thing you do is you point your, your wrist and fingers in the direction of the first vector in the product, the thing that comes first. Okay, so you just, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna curl your fingers through the angle theta, through the angle between the vectors, and since the second vector is into the board, then I have to, I'm, I'm keeping my wrist straight, but I'm just bending my fingers, and the only way I can stick my thumb out is in the minus x. Yeah, other questions? <coughs> Okay, so we need to practice this because we need to be good at it. <coughs> um, so notice that um, <coughs> the direction of the magnetic field depends on this cross product. So, <coughs> so if I have this proton whose velocity is this way, and I have an observation location here, so I want to know the direction of the magnetic field made by this moving proton at this location. <coughs> I can use the right hand rule, so it's V cross R hat, R hat is in the same direction as R, so I point my fingers in the direction of V, I curl them towards R, my thumb sticks into the board, so remember the symbols for <coughs> um, the board and out of the board. At, into the board you see the tail feathers of the arrow and out of the board you see the tip of the arrow, the point of the arrow. But I have to be careful because there's a Q in this equation and Q could be positive or negative. So the fact that it's a proton means I'm multiplying. So this is the cross product and the fact that this is a proton means I, I can, the, the magnetic field will be in this direction. But what if it were an electron? <coughs> then I'd get V cross B is into the board, but now I'm gonna multiply by a negative number because the charge of an electron is negative. In fact, <coughs> we'd get <coughs> the magnetic field of the electron would be coming out of the board in the, in the plus C direction, okay? So there are two things to worry about. One is the direction of the cross product and then the other is to remember whether the charge is positive or negative. All right, so let's try a few of those. Um, okay. <coughs> <coughs> uh, 
Okay. Here we have. Um, this is a proton. This is the x-axis here. This is the y-axis going up, and that's the z-axis there. So the proton is moving in the plus x direction. Okay. So the the green arrow is the velocity of the proton, and the yellow arrow. Okay, so the observation location is at the tip of that yellow arrow. Okay, so before we do it, what is the direction of the magnetic field made by the proton at that observation location going to be? So, so the answers are um, <coughs> so one, two, three, four, five, six, plus x minus x plus y minus y plus z minus z, okay? <coughs> okay, so what is the direction of the magnetic field made by that moving proton going to be at that observation location on the plus z axis? <coughs> okay, 5 you're saying, so 5 is plus z. So let's run it and find out. <coughs> and you're absolutely correct. It is in the plus C direction. <coughs> okay, so now we have an observation location on the plus Z axis. So when the proton starts to move, what is going to be the direction of the magnetic field at that location. <coughs> yeah, we're going to have to do a little... <laughs> green is velocity. So what's your answer? <coughs> okay, so I'm seeing fours and fives. Um, <coughs> so let's find out. <coughs> so that looks like negative y, which is indeed four. <coughs> okay, what do you think here? Yes, is that a question? Yes. Can you show it with your hand how it got to the negative y? Yeah. Hang on, let's rerun here. Um, okay, so okay, figure this out. It's a little bit awkward, but um, the proton is moving in the uh, plus x direction. So I'm going to point my fingers in the plus x direction. I don't necessarily even have to look at exactly at this diagram, okay? So if I try, if I try to align with this diagram, I'll, I'll point my fingers in the plus x direction. <coughs> Actually, I should do it this way because, okay, so I'm pointing my fingers in the x direction, okay? And then I curl them toward plus z. And my finger is going to my thumb is going to point down. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> you can align your you can align your hand with the diagram, or you can say, well, moving in plus. I'm just going to pretend the blackboard is so moving in plus plus z going down. Okay, so you can just remember the directions and make a coordinate system that works better for you. <coughs> um, yeah. It's Okay, so we've got a, I mean, you have to pick some camera angle, right? And if I pick that camera angle, you can't see anything, so. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so. Yeah, okay. All right, so now let's do one more. We're going to be on the minus. Negative observation location on the negative y axis. <coughs> Here, I want to make your life simple. 
So x is that way. <coughs> okay, observation location on the negative y-axis. <coughs> so plus z is now coming out at you. <coughs> so if you don't know, talk to your neighbor, and if you know, put your yeah. <coughs> You're saying six. I agree that it should be in the <coughs> negative uh, <coughs> negative z direction. So let's run it. And in fact, yes, it it's in the negative z direction. <coughs> and now we're starting to see this curly pattern, right? So as it moves toward us, we're seeing that the magnetic field it makes at observation location surrounding its path has this curly pattern. And so for an observation location on the negative z axis, what do we expect the magnetic field to look like? <coughs> OK, positive y. Let's see if it is. <coughs> Yep. <coughs> okay, let's do one more. <coughs> let's make it an electron and let's let it move the other direction. <coughs> okay, so an observation location on the plus y axis. <coughs> okay, this one should be actually kind of easy to do with your hand, right? <coughs> Oh, I'm hearing some disagreements. You better work it out here. <laughs> positive Z is coming out at you. Yeah, positive Z is coming out at you. Yeah, so here we are, like this, okay? Calculating the direction of the magnetic field, right? That it does include Q. Okay, so we have a consensus that it is 5, which is plus Z, which should be out of the board toward us. Let's see what happens. And you are absolutely correct. And I heard you saying all the right things. I heard you saying, yeah, V cross R. Um, was in the negative z direction, but we had to take into account the charge of the moving particle and the fact that it was negative and multiplying a vector by a negative number flips its direction. So, good job. We'll do one more and then we'll, we'll stop doing this. So, plus observation location on the plus z axis, electron moving to the left, um, <coughs> So what's the direction? Okay, so yes. the observation location is on the plus z axis. Okay. Okay, some people's hands are just getting so tired they can't. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so I'm seeing four, which is negative y. So let's see what happens. All right. So great job. So um, 
V cross R hat gave you plus Y, but then you multiply by negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs and got negative Y. So, okay, so you've got the idea. So, this is important to practice. Um, uh, okay, questions about that? All right. So we can calculate magnitudes too. <coughs> um, so suppose we have, what do we have? What's my velocity? Um, <coughs> we have a proton at the origin. <coughs> v equals negative 3 times 10 to the 4th, 0, 0 meters per second. Uh, the, what is B? So, at location 0 minus 0 0.060 0 meters, find B. Now this one, you could go through the whole formalism, um, but we actually don't have to. Uh, so here's our proton at the origin. Drawing a diagram really helps. Okay, so drawing, drawing diagrams is really a good idea. So the proton's at the origin. <coughs> We have V this way. Uh, we have R that way. <coughs> so what's the angle between V and R hat? 90 degrees, right? Okay. And so <coughs> it's actually fairly simple to just calculate the magnitude of V, which would be mu zero over four pi. <coughs> uh, Let's write it out. 1 times 10 to the negative 7 tesla meter per coulomb per second <coughs> times uh, plus 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs <coughs> times, let's move this diagram up. <coughs> uh, <coughs> So we have the magnitude of R is just 0.06 meters, right? So we have 0.06 meters squared. And now how do we evaluate the, the magnitude of the cross product V cross R hat? Yeah, we're going to use the sine thing. So we're going to use the absolute value, the, the magnitude of V, which is 0 0.06, sorry that's not V, the magnitude of V is 3 times 10 to the fourth meters per second, so that's the magnitude of V. <coughs> What's the magnitude of our hat? 1 <coughs> times 1. <coughs> And now we have the sine of that's a sine of 90 degrees. <coughs> and so we do a lot of arithmetic and we get uh, 1.33 times 10 to the negative 19 Tesla. And the direction is the direction of, this is a proton, so V cross R hat is going to be out of the board, so the direction is plus Z. So we can write this as a vector. It's going to be 0, 0, 1.33 times 10 to the negative 19 
Tesla if I got that direction right. I think I did. <coughs> right. So you could have used the full formalism and done the whole Z component of the cross product if you wanted to, or you could just do it this way. <coughs> What would be different if this were an electron? It, just the sign, right? So it just negative z direction. <coughs> so questions about that? Um, okay. So. Uh, there's kind of an interesting thing about um, this equation, <coughs> which is the following thing. So we suppose we, it, it's got this V in it, okay? And so V, we've never seen a, a field that depended on a velocity before. <coughs> and that leads to an interesting thing. Suppose you make a charged tape like you've done in lab. And then you, we hang it from the desk here. So I should have, oh, I have tape. All right, good, we'll make a charge tape. <coughs> Excellent, well-equipped lecture room. Okay, I don't really care about the sign of the charge, so I'm just gonna, yeah, it's charged. <coughs> Okay, so here is a charge tape hanging here. <coughs> and is this tape making a magnetic field at your location? No, because it's not moving, right? <coughs> but what if somebody who was really late for class <coughs> came in and ran past the tape holding a compass? Would they see a magnetic field? Yeah, because yeah, the tape is moving relative to them, right? So it looks like magnetic field depends upon In the rest frame, the tape isn't moving, but in a moving frame, the tape is moving and you do see a magnetic field. <coughs> so that's interesting. <coughs> and uh, so that sort of calls into question this equation. So, well then, what, what V are we supposed to be using here? <coughs> and the answer is the V in your reference frame. <laughs> okay, so if you're at rest, we're gonna use V equals zero, and if you're running past it with a compass, we're gonna use whatever V is relative to you, and we should get the right answer in our reference frame. But stay tuned, because it's anomalies like this <coughs> which made Einstein think real hard about, <laughs> about reference frames in motion. Yes, Henrik. Um, so is it uh, uh, an equation for like whenever it's near the speed of light then? Or is it... <coughs> is there... Uh, is there... I can't even remember. I don't think it's different near the speed of light. I think there's no gamma that shows up. Do you remember? I don't think there's a relativist, there, there sh it probably isn't correct near the speed of light. There should be a relativistic correction for this near the speed of light, no? Oh, 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 no. The Biot-Savart equation. No, this, this is the field of the moving No, I think yeah, I think I think you're right. No gamma in yeah, I think you're right. There's not there's not going to be a gamma. It's just whatever v is. Um, but if v got bigger than c, you'd get a weird result. But since v can't get bigger than c, it's going to be all right. <laughs> but some things happen to electric fields in moving reference frames too. So there's a set of equations that um, called the Lorentz transforms that allow you to to relate what you would see in a fixed reference frame to what someone else would see in a moving reference frame and vice versa. Um, there is, there is a 
magnetic field. Well, uh, yes, of course. Electric and magnetic field. Yeah, it's the but same. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's a propagation issue, but <coughs> let's stay tuned. <coughs> okay, so we can calculate the magnetic field of one moving particle, <coughs> uh, and if in lab we had equipment that made it really easy to make single moving particles and measure their fields, we'd be in good shape, but we don't. So what we need to do is um, get a quantitative relationship between the current in a wire and the number of moving charges and how fast they're moving so we can calculate, relate, calculate the magnetic field that would be made by, um, by charges moving in a wire. So, um, so let's talk about currents a little bit. <coughs> so we talked earlier about, about metals and wires are made of metal. Um, and the idea that, w that in a metal, each atom in this big metal lattice gave up one electron into a mobile sea of mobile electrons that could all move freely throughout the metal, shift back and forth. And we saw that in polarization, um, you know, if we had a point charge over here or some fixed electric field here, this electron C would shift until the metal was, was polarized and the net field inside the metal went to zero and then it was the equilibrium and there was no more charge motion. <coughs> so at equilibrium <coughs> in a metal, <coughs> so um, the net field was zero and the, the average drift speed uh, which was equal to the mobility times the magnitude of the electric field was zero. So this is the mobility. <coughs> well, what we do when we make a circuit is we, we work hard to keep the electric field from going to zero. We don't let it go to zero because we want charges to move in the circuit. <coughs> and so current running in a circuit um, is not at equilibrium. <coughs> so what we do is we arrange things in such a way that the net electric field inside our current carrying wire is not zero. And so the drift speed is not zero. And the current keeps running. And if the current isn't changing, which is the case in the circuits you built in lab, whenever it was the last week you were measuring potential differences, yeah. So the light bulb stayed the same brightness, current wasn't changing. We can call that a, we call that a steady state. So if the, the drift speed, average drift speed is constant, so we have a constant flow of electrons in our circuit. <coughs> Um, that's we call that a steady state and so we'll be working a lot with steady state circuits now there's something in between a equilibrium and steady state it's called a transient you know you're you're getting to the steady state or you're decaying out of a steady state going to equilibrium and we'll talk about that a little bit later <coughs> so we want to define uh, 
define current. What's current? <coughs> and we're going to work with two different definitions of current. The first is a sort of more elemental one, electron current. <coughs> we know that the things moving in these metals are electrons. And that's just the number of electrons per second uh, entering a section of a conductor. <coughs> okay, so if we have a wire with a cylindrical cross section here. Um, so an ordinary wire. And we stand here and we count the number of electrons per second that, that pass this location here. So if we could do that, that would, that would give us the, the electron current, number of electrons per second. <coughs> and Numbers in our circuits are going to be on the order uh, or something like about 10 to the 18th electrons per second. We uh, We use the symbol lowercase i to represent electron current. Um, <coughs> so, uh, There's another kind of current that we'll also talk about. It's called conventional current. Uh, and it has a capital I. <coughs> and it has units of coulombs per second. So, <coughs> Conventional current, which is a capital I, is just going to be equal to the average charge, the absolute value of the, a, a mobile charge, uh, the charge on a mobile charge times the electron current. And it's a positive number. And why do we have just wrong? Um, so he guessed, he, I mean, he didn't know. He knew he was making electric circuits. And he knew there was something, some charge moving in there. And he made this simple guess and guessed that it was positive charges. Um, and so that's, that's 50 actually, 50. what? Was it 50-50 chance? He had a 50-50 chance. No. He, he had a 50-50 chance. He just, it just, we didn't, we weren't able to demonstrate until much, much later. Well, I don't even think he knew about electrons at the time. Knew about negative charge, but not electrons. Weren't able to demonstrate until much, much later. Um, that yeah, it was about a hundred years that the uh, that the uh, the mobile charges in in metals were actually electrons were negative. <coughs> so so conventional current is what everybody used until <coughs> that was determined, um, and. Uh, <coughs> And it was kind of a cool experiment that determined that, actually. Um, and so, so all the meters you use, the, the thing you used as a voltmeter can also be used as a, to measure current. It measures conventional current. And it measures it in units of coulombs per second. And this has a name. It's called an ampere. For yet another French physicist. They must have been doing a lot of electricity and magnetism back then in France. Um, 
So, um, so we can work with either one. We're actually going to work with both because we're going to talk about what's really happening in the wires, <coughs> but then we're going to talk about things we can measure with our meters. Um, and uh, so, to, so the basic problem we're trying to solve here is that we want to be able to predict uh, the magnetic field that should be made by a given current running through a wire. And basically to do that, we just need to know, we can calculate the magnetic field due to one moving charge particle, but we need to know how many there are uh, and how fast they're moving in order to do it. Um, so, so basically what we want to do is figure out for a particular wire um, how many moving charge particles there are and how fast they're moving and then we should be able to just calculate the magnetic field made by one of them, multiply by the number and then we've got the magnetic field of the wire. So that's the basic idea. Um, so here's how we do it. <coughs> we consider a section of wire here. <coughs> so here's a section of our... We've got a long conducting wire here. <coughs> uh, and we're thinking about the electrons in a wire and let's say that they the electrons are moving that way <coughs> and so to get the electron current we want to count the number of electrons that are that are passing this location per second okay well so in some time delta t how many electrons are going to pass this location? Well, given the average speed of these guys, in some time delta t, all these electrons are going to move a distance v delta t. Okay? So here's an electron here, it's going to move a distance. So here's our distance. <coughs> V delta T, which is how far all these. Now these guys move a distance V delta T, but that doesn't help us because they don't cross our boundary. And these guys move a distance V delta T, but it's all the electrons in this cylinder <coughs> moving speed V delta T who are going to cross this boundary in the next delta T, right? So how many electrons cross this boundary in the next time interval V delta T? <coughs> well, <coughs> it's just all the electrons in this cylinder. If we, if we draw it like this, <coughs> it's all the electrons in this cylinder. Well, how many electrons are in that cylinder? Well, the number of electrons in here are going to be uh, the volume of this cylinder times the mobile electron density in this cylinder. So, <coughs> this is, N is the number of mobile electrons per cubic meter. It's the electron density. Okay? And the volume is just uh, well this cylinder has a length V delta T and it's got a cross-sectional area of of something, we'll call it A. <coughs> so the number of electrons in this cylinder, the number that are going to cross in a time delta T is uh, the electron density times 
the volume of the cylinder. So the number of electrons per second, <coughs> which is the electron current, is just NAV, this is the average drift speed, not a vector, divided by delta T. And so the electron current <coughs> is just the mobile electron density times the cross-sectional area of the wire times the average drift speed. <coughs> so real quickly, let's work out the average drift speed for a one of our currents. <coughs> so V is going to be equal to I divided by NA. <coughs> so we had about 1 times 10 to the 18th electrons per second, we said. <coughs> Mobile electron densities, what's, in, what's, a, what's a mobile electron density? Um, let's say it's on the order of 8 times 10 to the 28 electrons per cubic meter. Um, the cross-sectional area of our wire, a millimeter diameter. Okay, so pi times one times 10 to the minus third meters over two squared. And if we work that out, we get an average drift speed for an electron in one of our circuits is something like three times 10 to the negative fifth meters per second. Now that's just an amazingly small number. Okay, how long would it take an electron to, to travel 10 centimeters? Right? Why, do, why did light bulbs even light then? There are a lot of electrons. <laughs> okay, they're not moving real fast, but there are a lot of them in that wire. And so currents, the currents of the circuits we're building, these electrons aren't traveling fast, but they're just a whole lot of moving electrons. <clears throat> so we'll use this result next time uh, to work out the magnetic field made by uh, a current, be able to predict the magnetic field made by a current in a wire. Now, one of the things you're going to do in lab tomorrow is you're going to make some measurements along these lines, and then you're going to actually uh, try to measure the distance dependence of magnetic field made by current in a really long straight wire, like a meter length of wire, using a compass. And you don't know what to expect, and that's okay. It can just be exploratory.